Please, Madame la députée, uh, President of uh, Private Sector Corporate uh, Businesses, uh, we have a marvelous uh, audience, uh, and I am so happy that uh, Bruegel can, Jean, and uh, Guntram can present to the Prime Minister this image of public sector, private sector, institutions, and also, Mr. Prime Minister, a lot of journalists that are very anxious to hear you <laughs> as soon as possible. So it's a great, great pleasure to have you here. I had the privilege of listening to you uh, yesterday, if I'm not misled, <laughs> in Italy. And uh, I know that uh, you have a lot of messages uh, to ship in this occasion. Let me first uh, tell you that uh, uh, you are very, very impressive when one look at your own youth, if I may, because you are only, if I'm not misled, 46 years old. And uh, you started being a minister at 32 years old, but you've been minister of uh, economic affairs. You have been minister for industry and commerce. You have been minister for industry and foreign trade. You have been under Secretary of State to the Prime Minister. And so you have multiplied the angle of vision and the experience with a considerable attachment to Europe and to the European construction. You have also a fantastic experience in terms of Parliament, Sylvie. <laughs> the Minister has been Member of Parliament because you have been educated when you were very young in Strasbourg, in French, so you speak a fantastic French, and uh, this is one of the many languages that uh, you are uh, speaking. So, Mr. Prime Minister, we are, as I said, anxious, all public sector authorities that are here, uh, institutions, uh, private sector, and uh, we have eminent representative of the private sector, like Tijan, uh, which I uh, also uh, welcome very, very much amongst us. And uh, the journalists, as I said, are very, very anxious to hear you. You have a large part of the future of Europe in your hands because the future of Italy is, of course, absolutely decisive for the future of Europe. When I listened to your speech uh, yesterday, I could hear you mentioning earthquakes that you had experienced recently in Italy. And this is really a great chance for Italy to have you as prime minister. But you have so many challenges, uh, the, of course, the fiscal challenge, the macro policies challenge, the structural reform challenge, the productivity of your own country, which uh, should be, uh, of course, should grow uh, much faster than it does. And I know that uh, uh, you share those views because I, hear I have been the privilege, again, to hear you. And so, again, Mr. Prime Minister, if you want to tell us how you will do all what you can for Italy and for Europe, we would be so, so happy. So you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Jean-Claude. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm so glad to be here. It's a great opportunity. And thank you, Jean-Claude, for the perfect organization of this uh, wonderful evening. I know yesterday in Brussels it was a sunny day, so you perfectly organized this day, welcoming me with a very raining Brussels day, so thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> I feel at home today. Um, dear friends, I'm full of optimism uh, for the future. But I do not assume that the crisis is emerging, disenchantment with or even rejection of the European integration process is growing. As we move forward from crisis management to more structural issues, things become, become more difficult. The time has come to address these issues. If we do not do it, it will become difficult to move forward and we will remain stuck halfway. The reason why I raise this point tonight is because in the second half of next year, Italy will hold the presidency of the Council of Ministers. 
The Italian presidency will come at a crucial juncture for the European Union. In May next year, European citizens will elect a new European Parliament. In the following months, the European institutions will choose the new president of the European Commission and the new members of the Commission, the new president of the European Council and the new high representative. The persons will change, the policies must change. Europe will go back to drawing board and set out a new set of priorities and objectives of, for the future. And the next five years will mark a crucial phase in the evolution of the Union, a decisive legislature. They will be the moment to choose if we want to take a leap forward and make progress towards a new phase in the life of the European Union. I want the Italian presidency to be a connecting point and why we need a greater integration. First, how to deepen economic integration to support structural reforms at national level. Second, how to further greater integration in the single market. Third, how to, how to introduce some forms of risk sharing in order to make the EMU as a whole and the member states more resilient to shock. In all these areas, progress does not depend on technical discussions, but on reaching agreement on a different political approach. Those I will conclude with some thoughts on how we can make progress at a time in which support for European integration is getting thinner. Let's start with the economic union. The main tool we have devised devised to promote structural reforms at national level is the coordination of budgetary and economic policies. Indeed, the new coordination framework anchored in the European semester is one of the main advances made in response to the crisis. The striking symbol of this change in that this year all member states will send their annual draft budgets to Brussels in line with the requirements set out in the TUPAC. This system reflects the principle that economic policies are a matter of common interest. In short, interdependence requires responsibility. Let me just say here, on this com concept of responsibility, Europe has been shaping up a system of coordination based on an intergovernmental logic and it, it is now proposed to extend ex-ante coordination also to major economic reforms and introduce some form of mutually binding contractual arrangements between EU institutions and member states. There is a strong case for upgrading the existing framework. Indeed, today, Euro area economies are not less diver diverse. If anything, they diverge more than they did before the crisis in their effort. A stronger coordination framework should also address issues of ownership and accountability. By setting policy objectives and framing national choices, the European Union today intervenes in, area, in areas such as pension reforms, wage setting mechanisms, labor policies, which are at the earth of national politics and of prerog prerogatives of national parliaments. Some national parliaments feel under pressure for what they see as an intrusion that disempowers them. Some others stepped up controls on their executives to avoid that they take financial commitments in Brussels, prejudging their budgetary de decisions. At the same time, there is not an adequate discussion of, econo of common economic policies, policy priorities at EU level. The European Parliament is searching for a greater role in this area. The involvement of the European Parliament is essential to ensure the legitimacy and consistency of a system of a contractual arrangements between the EU institution and the individual member states. If we build an essential intergovernmental system of economic coordination, the tension with national parliamentary democracy is, unavo is unavoidable we may end up with one parliament against the other and we risk a paralysis of decision making. So to move forward towards greater economic union, 
we should embrace a broader no notion of responsibility, which recognizes a greater role for the European Union level. Let's now turn to the single market, my second point. The single market is Europe's best asset to restore growth. Market integration can also play a role in reabsorbing internal imbalances in the euro area. Yet, despite the political investment ba made by President Barroso, Commissioner Barnier, with the Single Market Acts 1 and 2, despite various European Council conclusions, progress is very slow. Everywhere, we see signs of resurgent economic nationalism. Can we reverse this trend and deliver real open markets just by discussing a list of new directives or regulations? Frankly, I don't think so. The only way is to build... We will insist that the calendar agreed by the European Council is respected. This applies to the telecommunication and the digital sector, which will be on the agenda of the next European Council in October. The ICT-driven economy can be a boost for employment and growth. A true single market can be instrumental to achieve this result. My third issue is the role of risk sharing and financial solidarity within the economic and monetary union. I believe that a genuine EMU will require some degree of risk sharing, and the crisis has shown that we cannot rely only on national budgets to absorb shocks and support the necessary adjustment. National tools can be inadequate and without a form of support from the central level, the economic and social price to pay for a member state can be dramatically high. The question is, what type of solidarity is acceptable, acceptable and justified within the context of the EMU? In truth, during the crisis, we have made important steps towards mutual insurance. European Financial Stability Fund, European Stability Mechanism, the ECB, our trade monetary transaction arrangement, are forms of collective insurance. At the same time, any move towards form of financial solidarity between member states has met with the resistance and has fooled a growing divide between debtor and creditor countries, the north and the south of Europe. One of the most worrying aspects of the euro crisis is that the embryonic sense of community that was emerging in Europe, cemented by the Erasmus generation and the use of the euro, has been shattered. Can we overcome this divide and agree on a common notion of solidarity? I believe that a notion of solidarity cannot be construed as a moral obligation of some to help others. This type of absolute solidarity presupposes a sense of community, which is not here. By some, that solidarity will be even perceived as unfair, a code for a transfer union. But solidarity can also be just enlightened self-interest, a, a form of reciprocity from which everyone benefits in turn and that does not lead to permanent transfers. That notion is at a level, a framework based on a predominant intergovernmental logica, logic will not work. It will not deliver the greater convergence of national economies the integration within the single market, and the resilience against asymmetric economic shocks that are required for a stable and sustainable functioning of the EMU. This is not just a reflection on governance. The ultimate purpose is to bring back growth and jobs. A better governance will allow the European Union to pursue more effective economic policies and to have a stronger role in the global system. Here comes the most difficult part of the challenge. Can we reali realistically aim for deeper economic, financial and fiscal integration at a time in which the confidence in European institutions and the support for the European Union are at an uh, all-time low? This enchantment with Europe is strong both outside and inside the euro area. 
in Italy, where public opinion was traditionally pro-European, confidence in the European Union has dropped today from 75 to 30 percent. What is interesting is that anti-European feelings are common to Southern and Northern Europe to substance, to what Europe can do to help member states fight unemployment, to promote the competitiveness of the manufacturing sectors, to exploit new sources of growth like the digital economy. The June European Council was an important step in this direction. On top of that, elections should allow to confront different political programs on Europe. It is important that citizens feel that European elections are for real, that they can choose different candidates for president of the Commission, and that they can influence the direction of policies at the European Union level. If the elections are a confrontation between technocracy and populism, we risk a backlash. The next European Parliament could be the most Eurosceptic Parliament ever, a parliament that cannot be an engine for Europe, but is a break on collective decision-making. So, in my view, we need to strike a fine balance between a realistic pragmatism and the right level of ambition for the future. As we complete and implement the measures agreed for the short term, we should not lose sight of the importance of longer-term objectives. Once we have restored confidence in the European Union institutions and forged a new political consensus on what is needed for a stable EMU and a stronger European Union, we can reflect on whether the current setup provides an adequate legal basis or we need a modification of the, of the treaties. This will also be an opportunity to reflect on how we can reconcile the needs of those members of the EU European Monetary Union, who need, deep e who need deeper economic, financial, and fiscal integration, and those member states who want to preserve a greater degree of sovereign autonomy within the European Union. Cher Jean-Claude, la première fois que je suis entré à Strasbourg au Parlement européen, j'avais 10 ans. Quelques années après, j'étais bien jeune, J'étais à Bruxelles quand Helmut Kohl, François Mitterrand, Jacques Delors négociaient avec moi-même Maastricht. Quelques ans après, j'ai écrit un petit pamphlet qui s'appelait « Mourir pour Maastricht ». Merci beaucoup, uh, Enrico. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, for this very moving uh, speech and uh, very, very moving uh, peroraison and finale. Uh, I understand that you accept questions, and uh, it would be very good if we could have uh, now a very vivid uh, session of question and answers. So I guess that uh, a microphone could be circulated. The problem. The political problem of being able to um, to convince our people, our voters, that, w that they will vote in the European elections, in the national elections, for decisions that will be the decisions um, influencing and changing what will happen in, uh, in Europe. That was not the case in the past. We had a sort of separation between elections and what happened. Elections, European elections, national elections, and then what, hap what happened was completely separated from uh, wha what uh, the voters decided. So this is why I mentioned the need immediately to create uh, a sort of uh, very strict link between uh, the next European elections and the choice of the new uh, European leaders. I think it's absolutely necessary. It will be impossible, in my view, to have the choice of a new president of the Commission 
made a night in our sunny Brussels uh, after one night of discussion among 28 people in a room. It will be impossible. The new leader of the Commission, in my view, has to uh, go out from a big European electoral campaign and is the first step and the rest also has to be very much linked with what the voters will decide. And of course it's the same for, for the national level. So at the national level we need to have institutions able to explain, uh, able to, to be strictly connected for wi with the decisions that we have to take. Um, of course, each country with, with uh, its own problems. Italy, we have problems, but the others have problems too. And, uh, but this link with the voters, in my view, is decisive. I don't want, I, I, I repeat wha what I said, I, I don't think that uh, a sort of uh, divide between technocracy and populists in the European, uh, uh, at the European level will be the solution. It will be a disaster. We need maybe different ideas of Europe, but political ideas of Europe, and uh, this is why we have to, in my view, to push. And there are uh, the UK, obviously, which is uh, potentially voting to get out of the EU. But generally speaking, you talked a lot about the Commission. How do you envisage uh, the management of the governance of Europe in, in a, what I guess we have to accept would be a two-speed Europe? I think we are superficially evaluating the big risk that Europe uh, is living about the future of the UK. I was in uh, London uh, half of, Jul of July um, discussing with many, in many in interest with many interesting shareholders and stakeholders of the problem. I think we are we have a superficial approach to the problem because the UK is risking to go out. And this risk, in my view, is a big risk for, you, for the UK, but it, it's a big risk to, you, to Europe too. I don't want to have the UK out. I want to have the UK on board. It will be a different Europe without the UK. It will be, in my view, uh, a poor Europe without the UK. So, because also for, for many reasons, for instance, I mentioned in my three points, one of them was the single market. Without the, the, the boost of, of, the, of the UK, be a permanent um, governance uh, position. And uh, if not, the ECB risked to have too many expectations, too many responsibilities and it's not in my view the the perfect and the good gift that we can give to the to the to the ECB ECB has to be protected respected and protected if we don't have governance institutions at 18 we will uh, ask to the ECB to have a job that is not the correct job for the ECB so is the other, in my view, main uh, achievement that we we have to to reach in the in the next uh, uh, discussions. But I, yeah, I sum up raising the point about the UK. We are. I it's a big risk. It's a big risk, and we are. I think we have to be on on this issue. We have to be more proactive. If not, the risk will be reality. Thank you very much. I would very much echo what you said on the, the ECBs has always asked the executive branches to be as responsible as possible. And I myself uh, in, in Aachen uh, asked for exactly what you said, uh, a very, very solid, I even said uh, Minister of Finance for, uh, for the EU area. So we have a question over there. You have the floor. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm Philippe Goudin from Barclays. Uh, 
I have to say I fully support uh, what you've said about the future of Europe and the need for more integration. And I also fully support what you've said about the, uh, the, 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 the risk of an opposition between the technocrats and, and the populists at the next European election. But my, my feeling is that today in many countries, uh, including in your country, there is a rejection of Europe as it is. And people uh, might be tempted to vote against Europe because Europe for them means uh, lower standards of living, uh, strong austerity, and, and they don't see what it's worth uh, for it. I mean, they, they, they are just uh, uh, rejecting this Europe as, as, as it is, uh, the Europe of the crisis. So what would you say to these voters to convince them that Europe is the only solution and to, to avoid having a, a significant vote for, for populists, which is clearly a risk in, uh, in your country. I think in France also there's a clear risk to see a, a strong vote for populist parties. Europe has only sacrifices. Uh, I think the result of the next European elections is already written, of course. But my second point is about the long-term future of Europe. Italy is a country, is one of the founders of the G G7 in 75. We were there in Rambouillet. We were there because we were the seventh. But of course, if we, maybe Jim, Jim will, will help me in that. If we write uh, in the year 2020, the next G7, based on the same procedures of Rambouillet, I think even Germany will be out. We will have there all the BRICS, the States, Japan, that's it. So the only way to stay in the G7 on 2020 <laughs> will be to stay united as Europeans. I think there is no other uh, topics, there is no other issues. This is the issue. And when you participate in a G20, it's very clear. And when, as Europeans, we are divided in the G20, it's, it's not good. Because the others are not divided. The Chinese, among them, they are not divided there. <laughs> they are united. The Americans, they are united. We, we are divided. So I think this is the crucial point. But, but really, is a problem of narrative. We have to, to explain, to present this perspective. And I think this, this is the topic. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm in Hebele from uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung newspaper group, Frankfurt. Um, you mentioned um, that you would support European champions, which I found very interesting. Um, from my understanding, we basically have one European champion, which was EADS. Obviously, they are struggling heavily with government interference. Um, Mr. Tom Anders is desperately <laughs> trying <laughs> to, to get out of that. Um, and so I wonder how exactly you would envision creating European champions that would be free from government interference on the one hand and strong on a global level on the other hand. Because I think Europe national regulatory authorities and it's too divided and we are not able to build um, the, the dimension needed for the global competition. So this is why I think we have to to help a regulatory system able to, to have this, this new big dimension. Um, I was not happy when EADS and BA systems decided not to have the merger. Uh, I think it was one year ago, one year at half ago. Because I think we need in Europe dimension, big dimension, big dimension. And I was very happy when NL and Endesa had the merger because it's very important to have I repeat not only national based companies but European uh, companies so it's uh, of course the, the need is for government not having the short term and problems immediate problems as the priority the, the, the crucial point is to have regulations allowing mergers 
and not fighting against mergers. But what I want to, to say is that the dimension and the European dimen dimension of our companies, it's, uh, it's a need for the future. So I hope the next European uh, institutions, it's, it's a problem for the Commission, it's a problem for, for the nation states, can deal with these problems with the idea to help the raising of the dimension of the companies. My feeling is that is one of the, of the priorities for the future. Thank you very much. I know, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, that y you'll have to, to leave, to, to quit uh, rapidly, but would you accept three last questions? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, let me only say, no, I'm sorry, you're not part of the three. <laughs> uh, only to, to say that EADS has had a dramatic change of its governance, as you know, and we are now in a totally different universe in this company. So uh, I think it, it, has b it is uh, one of the few good signs that we have to present uh, uh, on this remarkable success. Uh, I, I have Guntram, then you, sir, and then uh, you. Guntram. I was very impressed by um, the importance you attach to community institutions and you stress very much the ECB but also the European Commission. Um, at the same time, the in intergovernmental uh, system. I think we have to stop this trend and we have to come back and overcome the present crisis with more communitarian institutions ready to, at 28 level, ready to solve some problems and to, to be the, the big push for having uh, achievements and so on. And the, the crucial point is the commission, in my view. The crucial point is the commission. A commission able to be leader, leader of initiatives, leader in in the in all the European discussion, leader with the with the countries, able to deal with the countries in wi with this idea that I I raised sacrifice sacrifices and promised land, not only sacrifices plus sacrifices, and not only promised land and just promised land, but both together. If not, it will be impossible to to have the feeling with the voters, with the citizens. So my feeling is that we need more communitarian approach, and this communitarian approach um, means, of course, the Commission and the European Parliament as the two main uh, pillar of this communitarian approach. And next legislature, legislature, the next European legislature will be a success if these two institutions will uh, regain power. If not, the next legislature will be not a European success legislature, in my feeling. You have already the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Valeria Cipollone from Bruegel. As um, I am Italian, I will drive a bit the attention to Italy. You cited in you said in your speech that the trust in European institution has fallen to 30%. And I think that if we do the same calculation in Italy with respect to the Italian government, the percentage will be even lower. So my question is rather simple. What would you say to a uh, young uh, woman or a young man that would like to stay in Italy but does not find a workplace or has to face many difficulties? So wha what would you say to convince to stay? Thank you. Was the question that yesterday morning um, I, I had in the in the discussions we had in Chernobyl when Jean Claude was there, and of course is 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 the true nightmare of in my country my personal nightmare because I see all the young men young women around Europe around the world having good opportunities well-performing, high skills, out of Italy. Of course, it's, it's a huge problem for us. And the main, the main problem is to, first of all, to start to change the country, starting with giving the possibility to young people to 
have a good education and, first of all, a good first job. That is not the case in Italy. In this very period we start, this is one of them, for instance. So, step by step, I hope to give a different idea of our country, a country in which people is able to, 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 to study, to improve the skills, and of course to find jobs, job, uh, jobs at the level of their education and good opportunities. That, that is the main point, the crucial point. If not, with a 40% youth unemployment, the country will not have a future. This is for sure for me. The country will be just a gerontocratic old country without any possibility to have a good develop development for the future. So is the crucial point, and it was for me the crucial point of the first four months of government. It will continue to be the crucial point because I share your point. Without achievements here, it will be impossible to give hope for the future. My name is Art de Geus, Bertelsmann Stiftung, Germany. Thank you very much for the excellent way you presented a perspective for the future of Italy and connected with the future of Europe. I knew you are the Prime Minister of Italy, but tonight I got the pleasure to get to know a truly European, a truly visionary European. Two elements in your vision on the future of Europe I will take away from tonight and on one I want to ask a further explanation. The first thing you explained on the question of Guntram that for Europe maybe we need a stronger European Commission and if I understood you rightly this chairman of the European Commission should not only have the vote of the council but should have a mandate from an electorate. On the second point, you spoke as necessary for the coordination in Europe between governments of a kind of incentive, which I understood would be an incentive on some occasions to make the choice for a better Europe, even if that would be against the short-term national interest. Could you explain or el elaborate a little bit on what kind of incentive you would mean by that? At local level, something that we have to decide at national level and other important issues we can decide only at the European level. When I think, for instance, of trade, we were all together, the, the, the Europeans in, uh, in the G20 discussing with, with the Chinese and I discussed, I have a bilateral meeting with the South Korean president about uh, trade issues and very difficult to have Italy and China a discussion on trade issues. It's, it's not <laughs> exactly that. It's like, it's like a fly and an elephant <laughs> discussing among them. So it's the only way is to have, but I repeat, what it's very important is the narrative on that. We need to be to be able to to explain to our citizens, and it's uh, he has to be a fair game, because we, the national leaders, we are we are used to say, "I am asking you sacrifices because of Brussels." That is not an easy help to the popularity of Brussels. <laughs> um, but Brussels, too, has to have a relationship, a trustable relationship, a relationship with in, in which trust is a, is, a, is, a, is a good word. Trust means, okay, a trust. A trust in what we are doing, what you are presenting. It's a... It's a yeah, I think it's the, it's the correct way. So I repeat my mantra, sacrifices and then promised land. And I think this point about the promised land, I think is crucial today for giving to, the, to our voters uh, the idea really of a future. And the idea of a future 
and a future organized by national uh, countries, national institutions, and the European institutions. So I, I don't know if, if the, 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 the answer is the correct one, but it's, in my view, the, the, the crucial point. And of course, I repeat, it's not technocracy against populism. It's politics. It's politics with accountability, responsibility, and leadership. I think what we what we had different. Ils avaient une attitude très différente. Mais il, à la fin, ils ont fait l'Europe, ils ont fait Maastricht. Euh, naturellement, il y avait de l'or, mais ils ont fait tout ça. Donc, si votre question est si Merkel et Hollande peuvent être deux grands moteurs d'une Europe, euh, moi je dis oui, parce qu'ils sont assez différents. Si je, si je les ai bien compris. <rire> Mais ils sont tous les deux, ils sont tous les deux, de ce que, que j'ai vu, ils sont tous les deux euh, très européens. Ils comprennent que le futur de leur pays est un futur qui ne peut être que euh, dans l'Union européenne en ayant un rôle de leadership de, de l'Union européenne. Donc, euh, moi, je dis que je suis absolument... Je rêve qu'il y ait un couple franco-allemand qui prenne le leadership. Je rêve de ça. Parce que l'Europe a besoin de leadership et l'Europe a besoin de faire les pas en avant qui sont absolument nécessaires. Thank you for your generosity. <laughs>